Welcome. My name is Chris Fru, CEO of BioBuzz Networks, and we're here today at the third annual Philly Builds Bio Life Science Symposium. Here in the heart of the city, where we're gathering with over 100 attendees and dozens of speakers who came together to talk about life science innovation and all the amazing things happening here in Philadelphia. I'm very honored today to be joined by Matt Gardner. Matt, thank you for joining me. Thanks, Chris. Happy to be here. Terrific. Why don't we start off, uh, do you mind giving a quick introduction to yourself and your organization? Sure. So my name is Matt Gardner. I'm the head of life sciences in the Americas for CBRE. Uh, it's a large network globally between Americas, EMEA, and APAC that serves life science clients on both the investor side in lab and manufacturing real estate, as well as the user side. Uh, we also have a, a very deep set of services we provide to users in the space that will outsource everything from building management to uh, engineering to building equipment. So all those services kind of comprehensively available at CBRE. That's terrific. Uh, well, I'm excited to have you here today uh, with, a, with a, the global perspective that you have, but the event is Philly Builds Bio. Right. So we are here to talk about Philly. W why is this a, an important event that you're participating in? Well, I think, you know, events like this in every one of the main biotech clusters are really important touchstones to make sure we see how everybody's holding up, how the ecosystem is faring, what kind of health and vitality we see in the startup and venture capital spaces related to giving birth to new ideas and delivering them to market. So uh, Philly Builds Bio is, is one of those that combines that set of issues with how the real estate ecosystem is connecting to it. And it's a, it's a great way to just make sure that we keep an eye on the vitality and the, let, let me use the word vibrance in that system and making sure it's humming. I like it. I, li I like it. We could also say buzzing. Oh, yeah. it's handy. Um, so uh, maybe could you talk about what that looks like for Philly? Like, what are some of the things in the Philadelphia's uh, market that kind of stand out that, that you maybe hear from people that are interested in, in kind of opening up in, in a new area? Yeah, I would say globally, Philly is kind of known for two things primarily. One is that it's one of the original locations of the pharma industry. And so you can go back 150 years and find pharma companies founded between here and, oddly enough, Brooklyn, uh, that were the first class, really, of, of pharma uh, in the U.S. And so it's been the traditional home of, uh, of quite a few of those companies. Some of them have disappeared by mergers, and some of them have been acquired by Philly headquartered companies. And so it's always been one of the anchors for over a century, uh, and that's to its good fortune. It's got the management talent the capital and the depth of knowledge in things like product uh, and commercialization and uh, regulatory affairs and the kinds of things that small biotechs need. More recently, since the 1990s, it's really been the headquarters of cell and gene therapy. And so it's in that vein that we see more recent activity, a whole new class of drugs, hundreds of them uh, that are coming along providing cures. Uh, and so it really, you know, any one of those kind of leaps in science takes 10, 20 years to develop. We got gene therapy wrong a little bit at the beginning. Same thing happened with monoclonal antibodies. It took 20 years to figure that stuff out. Science is hard. Clinical trials are brutal. Uh, but we're coming through that now with uh, the very beginning of a wave of products and cell and gene that will be lots of treatments and cures for patients on the way. So Philly's the headquarters for that. It's been a great benefit to the community here to see that science or, or originate from here. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, yeah, we've seen, uh, I think uh, it's good to hear that there were just the beginning of this wave because we've seen it. It's been a pretty busy 2024 for right. some approvals. Something that you mentioned um, is interesting. So not every ecosystem has a combination of pharma and bio in it. How unique is that and, and how valuable is that for like the bio innovation ecosystem that is emerging? Yeah, you would have said, I think in the 1990s and into the early 2000s that the separation was that the large molecule and protein space was reserved for bio. And the small molecule space was exclusive domain of pharma. That's all been merged away. Uh, you know, three, four cycles of m &A activity into the mid 2000s, the difference was gone and everyone has all of it now. So if you look at the pipeline of any mature 50, 100 year old, one of those titans in the industry, they're gonna have all of the above. So there's, I think really very little difference other than the roots. And so if you look at, uh, I used the example earlier in the program here at Philly Builds Bio that uh, to me, Philadelphia resembles a little bit of the sort of anti-San Diego in the sense that pharma started the ecosystem here. 
It didn't really have a biotech ecosystem until many years later. San Diego started as pure biotech and became pharma through acquisition, you know, several generations into J and J and Pfizer acquiring companies there. So they're very much opposite or contrasting pictures of the ecosystem being built by risk takers a hundred years apart. Uh, and so I think Philly's very unique in having an unbelievably large, mature army of management talent uh, and, you know, more recent biotech that fills in the picture. Yeah, that's great. And and for, for drugs really to make it to market, it's that management talent that you really need. And, you know, complimentary, Philly has tremendous academic and research talent. And, and again, some of the innovations coming out of here, but, but is that that management talent that enables the product to get to market? That's right. So, you know, any sort of pre-product, pre-revenue biotech in that toughest phase of high failure rates in biotech is going to go through that stretch of time where it's thinking about build, buy, or partner for its lead products. Many of those companies are not going to take their own first products to market. They're going to partner them. When you have the kind of management talent that you have here from all of that sort of depth of pharma experience, it's got an enormous advantage in regulatory affairs and commercial launch, sales organizations, production, uh, and worldwide supply chain in the industry. So regardless of whether you're making an, an API for a, a chemical compound or a biologic, you know, the understanding of how the FDA works and how products are launched and supported in uh, whatever medical space and whatever indications you're going to be in, the management talent, generally speaking, has been here for decades. And so we're four or five generations into that here in a way that's impossible to replace yeah. uh, by more recent sort of biotech clusters. Yeah. Generally, it'll take generations. It's, yes. You know. Yeah. Um, well, it, it's no, you know, no secret. It's been a tough couple of years in, in this in this industry. Uh, I wonder, could you give your perspective on kind of where the, we are with the life science real estate uh, market right now? And maybe do you have any forecast for, you know, uh, what's to come? Yeah. Thanks, Chris. I think it, it certainly has been a, a down cycle since I would say Q1 of 2022, if we look back, uh, I think the history will show that the peak was late 2021. Probably lots of startup CEOs wish they had taken the price they were being offered in fourth quarter of 21. It was gone, you know, less than six months later. I think now we've seen that we, you know, went through an incredible bull run that the industry's never before seen. So something like a seven year run from 2015 to 2021 of continued upswing in new investment new capital sources coming to the industry for the first time, leading to an investment in new science that the industry, generally speaking, is still carrying. And that's really where we see the most important fundamental to keep an eye on. That's what sort of keeps us an even keel, even when we're sleepless at night. So I think what's so exciting about that long wave is that it's led to generational new science. Some of it has gone through a real rough patch here these two years, but we look ahead at you know, this short-term adjustment to a little bit of over-delivery of new space in the short term. But in the long run, that science is mostly being carried. If you look at overall R&D headcount across the industry, over our overall R&D investing across the whole industry, it's staying up. It's holding at that new level. So we've reached new heights here in that amount of science being carried forward. That's why we sort of look at this as an adjustment. We'll get through this as we have three or four cycles previously. If you're been around the industry long enough to have lived through 1999 or 2007 or any number of those uh, waves that we went through, you know, we, we come through it. I think what we expect, though, is it'll take probably until Q4 of 2025 to get through this absorption cycle. And we'll begin to see the next round of new investments uh, in campus developments and an, another round of uh, a generational form of startups, probably late 25 and into 26. That's great. Well, I think, you know, I, I could hang on that lot. So I think yeah. that's, that's good to know that I've got about a year, year, <laughs> year and a quarter to hang. I'd say, uh, Chris, in, in biotech, one year's, it's not, not very long. Not very long yeah. at all. Um, yeah, that's great. So uh, if I could just recap. So it sounds like um, it, there seems to be a, a steady state in, in funding and, and, you know, the kind of where the capacity is right now. But you're bullish on the fact that it was just seven-year bull run of of innovation and almost like a pent up or a bench of right. new development that have the potential to meet, uh, come out to market. That's right. And, and obviously the capital market's been frozen. Mm -hmm. So we look at the, you know, roughly $5 trillion in capital that's sitting on the sidelines, a little more than that right now. 
some of that is beginning to come back into the field. We saw an uptick in early stage investing late last year. I think all those things are the right kind of signals to tell us the science is going to carry. Some of it will get consolidated, and that's natural in our industry. It's always been the case. Uh, but we have lots of reasons to stay optimistic about where the science is headed. That's great. Well, I can't think of a better way to wrap things up uh, than, than with a, a, an outlook of optimism here from Matt at CRB. Uh, thank you for taking the time to share with us today and being part of Philly, Philly Builds Bio. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Chris Frew, uh, CEO of BioBuzz Networks. We're here recording live at Philly Builds Bio. Thank you. Thank you.